Does it matter what you believe? No. No. If you believe wrong pursuant to what they told you, that's fraud. That's it. So that's the, that's the concepts behind why you can go after them for their behavior. So what must they do? They have two choices. Now, if they return you all of your money that you've paid, your down payment, interest penalties, blah, 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 is that a, is that a viable alternative to giving you the loan? Here's the reason why. Because by not giving you the loan, did you not incur other costs? Okay. So then aren't they responsible for those other costs? Under the law they are. Now if they give you the loan and they just gave it to you a little late, is that a better situation? Yes, it is. But what have they just admitted to? Can they win? No. No, not without a very corrupt judge, bad paperwork, or your inability to handle yourself properly in court. You will find, and I harp on this in, in every class, if you look at Black's Law, 6th edition, the words understand and understanding. In every case that we go to, the judge will always ask, do you understand? You can't understand anything in court. Understand can be used to divest you of your property. So if you understand something, you can be divested of your property. If you don't understand, if you never understand, you can never be divested of your property. That's American law. Sorry. That's it. And they'll, they'll do it. I've never been to a court case, and I've been to hundreds, literally hundreds of court cases, criminal and civil of all types. The judge will always ask if you understand. Now, I screw with them a lot because I'll say I do understand something. I, you know, I'll understand this or that, but I don't understand or I don't comprehend or I do comprehend this because I know how to mess with judges. I would just tell you flat out, you don't understand anything. You don't understand. If you look at the prefatory statement, and I go back to that a lot, uh, because one of the statements in the prefatory statement is that, I think it's the last, it's like the bottom of page two, it says, I don't understand how this court can assist the banks in, no, that's on the desk, it's not in the book, I apologize. Uh, I don't understand how the, the banks, with the assistance of the court, can divest me of my property through the bank's criminal acts of filing fraudulent documents. They've got to respond to that. And for the life of me, I can't think of how. Uh, I think pretty much that's... Are we all up to date on the deed of trust and the note? Do you think you all got those aspects? Okay, uh, Patrick, you got some questions, please? After I get through these questions, we'll, we'll start on the next part. If they refinance my home uh, with a loan and I receive some portion of that loan into a bank account, did they perform? Well, I understand that as a promissory note, the promissory note generated that $300,000 or whatever the amount is. No, it didn't. Promissory note has nothing to do with the deed of trust. I'm, I'm telling you, when you ask me a question, and you talk about the deed of trust, and in that same sentence, in that same paragraph, in that same concept, you bring up the note, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. One has, not, one has nothing to do with the other. <laughs> 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 
one has nothing to do with the other. So if you want to ask me about the deed of trust, please do. If you want to ask me about the note, please do. But if you put them together, I'm not going to be able to make sense of it. So I'll ask the question again. If they refinanced my home with a loan or with a, they refinanced my home and in the close of escrow gave me partial amount of that as refinanced in cash or into a checking account, did they perform? Okay, they may have partially performed to a much less extent than you think. Here's why. Let's just go with some round numbers to make a little sense. You got a HELOC, a refinance, blah, 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 whatever you want, $100,000. There were liens out on that property for $80,000. So somehow you wind up with $20,000. We got the math so far, correct? They took the $80,000, which was your money. They were the holder of your money. It was not their money. They were the holder of your money. They went and bought those liens in their name. That's a criminal act. It's called unlawful conversion. As a holder, you have rights. If you have rights, you have responsibilities. You have duties. You have obligations. They were the holder of your money. They should have gone and bought the liens in your name and not theirs. There's another act of criminal fraud. Yeah. They, 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 no, they didn't pay off the liens. They paid them off in their name. They should have paid them off in your name. It was your money. You gave them the deed of trust. Okay? They go around paying it off in their name. Okay? That's how they do it. That's how their system works. What they should have done is given you, when you gave them the deed of trust, they should have given you the cash. You got out and paid, paid them off, paid off the liens, paid it off. Now it's a whole separate concept. I don't want to go too in-depth in that, okay, because that's not going to get you very far. That usually involves uh, second loans. Uh, you know, your, your, your primary loan is where you're going to get the foreclosed on. That's where they're coming after you. Yeah, okay, and refinance too. Uh, there's a little more to it. But if you follow the same guidelines as if it's an original loan, just think of it as, as buying the house. Not that you've been living in it and refinance. It's just a purchase vow. If you work along the same understanding that the note and the deed of trust are separate, it'll work out the exact same. You just got to put the math to it. And before we take another question, I, I need to get something in your head because, and I'll do this every time I get a question where you're going to mix the deed of trust and the note because you'll drive me nuts with that. Because I, I know it so well and I know how hard it is for every, I, I've been doing this for months. So I know how hard it is for you to really get past that wall. Now his wife does, because he had life insurance. <laughs> now there's a much younger guy in a much smaller night suit. Never mind. <laughs> If you were to do this, give them the note, and they gave you the house, and didn't sign that deed of trust, is that a, a viable business deal? I can't discuss any more than that. We'll leave that there. Make your own conclusion. Think about it. And I just can't tell, go any deeper than that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, my question is, is they sold my house at auction yesterday. I, I can't hear you. They sold my house at auction yesterday. But okay. it didn't sell. The bank ended up. It's an REO now. Uh, all right. 
You know what? Hold on to that question. Are there any more questions? We will jump into that right after we finish up this section because that is very important. Uh, you got a couple over here, Patrick. Oh, I don't think you need to duck, Patrick. We can look a few pictures of your back. I have a couple of questions, if I may. I want to understand the endorsement on the note. It discharges the debt just because they have no, sold no, it? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. The endorsement does not discharge the debt. Altering a note discharges the obligor of the obligation pursuant to the UCC. In other words, if the person that receives the note alters that note. Now, what is, it actually says alters and modifies. Now, what does that mean? If you look at the, the jurisprudence, it's really not ambiguous at all. It, it pretty much is inclusive of anything. If you punch holes in it, and they do that to put on little legal tabs. If you add words, if you change the amount, if you modify the obligation of any party. Now let's talk about that. What do the words without recourse mean? It means to modify the obligation of one of the parties. So if they did nothing but stamp without recourse on that promissory note, they have by law, knowingly, intelligently, and willfully, with full knowledge of the consequences thereof, discharged the obligation of the obligor. That's it. That's law. I didn't write the law. That section of the law I actually like. But that's it. We are done at that point. Understand, they'll have a bunch of stamps on there. The gentleman in the back, four stamps. I've seen 32. One. One. If you take one match and hold that note to it and light it on fire, is one match enough? It's enough. That's it. If your dog ate it, is that enough? One's enough. Okay. okay. Thank you. If a trustee has been substituted and recorded, can the prior trustee sell the property at foreclosure sale? No. See, my girlfriend on her property, I've done the legal work for her, and she made me the trustee. She substituted me as the trustee. When we went to the foreclosure sale, I told them that they were not the trustee. Okay. <sighs> yeah, where's Jack and Jim and their brother Jose? Because I'll tell you, all right, we're going to go there. I don't want to go there. I've been there, but we got to go there. Oh, you don't have to follow me to the damn coffee pot. Jeez, now you're going to see my butt. Does she not have the right oh, to substitute the to trustee? Okay. In April of 08, some attorneys put a document in, in my criminal case uh, stating some facts before the court. It destroyed my life. So I spent eight months. It, it, let me just give you a caveat. I know this law probably better than anybody in the United States. I have no doubt. I spent eight months being tortured almost every day. I was the lead witness against Joe Arpaio for his torture and murder cases in federal court while I'm in his jail. Joe Arpaio would be like Hitler without a spine very horrible human being and yeah I'm saying this on tape because I said it in federal court 